What a beautiful time it is to live in 19th and 20th century China! That is, if there were no internal rebellions, a crumbling economy, foreign imperialist pressure, and child emperors at hand. If there were only someone who could fix our great country. I could fix that. I could fix that too. Welcome to the roots of the Chinese Civil War, a time of change, turmoil, and political tug of war. Picture this, the late 19th century China, a country struggling to keep up with the times. We've got foreign imperialism, internal rebellions, and a crumbling imperial system at hand. Also, we have several child emperors that were responsible for the fate of several hundred million people. First that one, then that one, and then that one. So things were about to get interesting. We are in the period of the Qing Dynasty, China's rulers for over two centuries. But let's just say they were having a rough time modernizing the country. It's like trying to make a TikTok on an old Nokia. Not the most successful endeavor. While the Qing Dynasty faced its own trials, various political ideologies emerged and spread rapidly throughout the country. Intellectuals, students, and military officers, they all wanted change. They wanted to overthrow the Qing Dynasty and create a new Republican government. Revolution was in the air, and it smelled like victory. And then in 1911, BAM! The Xinghai Revolution occurred, and the Qing Dynasty was like, I'm out of here. And subsequently, the Republic of China was born. But hold your dragon boats, folks. The next republic had its fair share of challenges itself. Warlords were popping up left and right. The central government was about as strong as a wet noodle, and foreign powers were poking their noses into China's affairs. It was a messy situation. But amidst the chaos, two political forces emerged. The Chinese Communist Party and the Nationalist Party, or the Kuomintang. Initially, the CCP and Kuomintang formed an unlikely alliance. They were like frenemies, teaming up to take on the warlords and pushing back foreign influence. But let's just say their bromance wasn't built to last. You see, the CCP wanted a socialist state, while the Kuomintang had its heart set on a unified country with a somewhat democratic government and a capitalist economy. These ideological differences, combined with good old-fashioned power struggles, strained their relationship. And before you could say Great Wall, things were about to get real messy. We enter the Northern Expedition, a grand plan to eliminate those pesky warlords and bring the nation together. It was like a road trip, but with a lot more battles and a lot less singing in the car. Hey, I don't really want to do this anymore. The Kuomintang achieved some success in their efforts to overcome challenges and unite various parts of China. However, when unity among their ranks weakened, it resulted in less favorable outcomes. Internal divisions and a lack of coordination with the Chinese Communist Party proved to be quite the roadblock. No, I don't want to watch Peppa Pig tonight! No, you already decided what we should watch yesterday. Today it's my turn! The two parties were like a pair of stubborn siblings who couldn't agree on which channel to watch, and just when you thought things couldn't get any messier, they did. In 1927, Chiang Kai-shek, the new leader of the Kuomintang after Sun Yat-sen's passing, unleashed a storm of violence that shattered a fragile alliance between the Kuomintang and Communist Party. This event, known as the Shanghai Massacre, was like a thunderbolt that struck the heart of their collaboration. It was the breaking point and the end of the line for their partnership. The Shanghai Massacre left scars that would fuel the fire of the coming conflict. The stage was set for the showdown between the CCP and the KMT, like two boxers stepping into the ring, ready to throw punches. And as if internal conflicts weren't enough, external factors were determined to stir the pot in China as well. The Empire of Japan entered the picture, making a grand entrance with their ambitious agenda for expansion. So, we would really like to have a little bit of your territory. How about you just hand us Manchuria over? What? No! Okay, no problem. We fully understand and respect your decision. We will not. And then in 1931, Japan invaded Manchuria, creating a puppet state and leaving China in a state of shock. I hate the Japanese! Sorry, you hate who? 
Certainly not the Japanese. I love the Japanese. This invasion weakened the Chinese government even further and ignited widespread anti-Japanese sentiment among the population. And it wasn't until the outbreak of the Second Sino-Japanese War in 1937 that the CCP and KMT found themselves on the same side again. The war against Japan provided a temporary truce and a chance for them to regroup and push back against the invaders. But let's not forget, folks, that old habits die hard. You go to the front. No, you go to the front. And so, even with their newfound alliance, deep-seated ideological differences and power struggles couldn't resist making a grand appearance. Amidst the chaos of war, even amidst the fight against Japan, the CCP and KMT soldiers couldn't resist their knack for disagreement. But one thing was for certain, Japan had awakened a united, albeit temporary China. With Japan's surrender, China found itself at a crossroad. The Communist Party led by the charismatic Mao Zedong and the Kuomintang under the watchful eye of General Chiang Kai-shek were like two rival street performers competing for the crowd's attention. The initial years after Japan's surrender were filled with a fragile ceasefire and attempts at reconciliation, like a couple trying to mend their broken relationship through couples therapy. So, peace? Sure, why not? This was certainly no love story. Deep-seated ideological differences and power struggles were destined to keep them apart. Now peace? No. It wasn't long before negotiations broke down in 1946, and both sides decided to let their guns do the talking. The early stages of the war were like a wild game of hide-and-seek. The CCP, like sneaky foxes, sought to consolidate their power in the rural areas, while the Kuomintang held on to control over the urban centers. Welcome to Shenyang, a city of industry and transportation, now caught in the crossfire of the Chinese Civil War. It was like being stuck in traffic during rush hour, except with bullets flying instead of angry honks. In October 1948, the CCP, led by Marshal Lin Biao, set their sights on capturing Shenyang for the Kuomintang. The Battle of Shenyang was no laughing matter. It witnessed fierce fighting between the determined Kuomintang forces, led by General Du Yuming, and the crafty CCP forces utilizing guerrilla tactics and strategic military operations. The CCP's superior coordination, support for the local population, and effective military strategies gradually tilted the scales in their favor. With each passing day, the CCP tightened their grip on Shenyang. The CCP gradually encircled the city, cutting off supply lines and isolating the Kuomintang forces. The siege lasted for several weeks, during which the CCP forces launched a series of offenses aiming to weaken the KMT defenses and ultimately capture the city. And so, after fierce fighting and strategic maneuvers with the Kuomintang forces heavily outnumbered, Shenyang fell into the hands of the Communist Party of China. It was a significant victory in their quest for control over the entire northeast of the country. But that was just the start. Welcome to Changchun, a major industry and transportation hub and another jewel in the crown of northeast China. Caught in the crosshairs of the Laoshin campaign, the KMT had established a stronghold in northeastern China, and Changchun was a key part of their defensive line. The CCP and their guerrilla warfare expertise had their eyes set on this important city. That worked about like this. Wow, what a beautiful and peaceful day it is today. You're right. The Kuomintang forces, stubbornly entrenched within the city, put up a valiant resistance. But the CCP, determined to add Changchun to their collection, used their guerrilla tactics, strategic maneuvering, and support from the local population to gain the upper hand. The CCP starts to surrender the city and cuts off its supply lines, gradually squeezing the life out of the KMT's grip of the city. The Kuomintang, led by General Du Yuming, attempted counteroffenses to reclaim lost territory, but their conventional military approach proved less effective against the CCP's modern guerrilla-style urban warfare. And the Laoshin campaign was no picnic. The battle was fierce, casualties were heavy, and the struggle for control of key cities continued to shape the course of the Chinese Civil War. And so the tide of the Chinese Civil War continued to turn. The CCP's momentum surged forward with not just one, but two major campaigns. 
the Huai Hai Campaign in Central China, and the Ping Jin Campaign in the North. In Central China, under the leadership of Marshal Chen Yi and General Liu Bocheng, the CCP launched a coordinated offensive attack against General Hu Zongnan's Kiaomintang forces in the Huai Hai Campaign. It was like a grand dance of strategy and maneuvering. The Huai Hai Campaign witnessed a series of victories for the CCP, culminating the encirclement and defeat of the KMT troops in Zuzhou. It was a blow that reverberated through the KMT ranks, my friends. Meanwhile, in the north, Marshal Peng Dehai and his CCP forces engaged the Kiaomintang in the Ping Jin campaign. It was a game of cat and mouse as the CCP utilized their guerrilla warfare tactics to outmaneuver and outsmart their opponents yet again. Through strategic maneuvering and successful assaults, the CCP emerged triumphant, capturing both Beijing and Tianjin, the jewel in the KMT's crown. The CCP's guerrilla warfare tactics combined with the unwavering support of the rural population played a significant role in their success. The Kiaomintang, on the other hand, faced internal divisions, corruption, and dwindling popular support, even with substantial aid from the United States. But that wasn't yet it. The war continued with the Huai Hai Campaign, a clash of titans that would determine the fate of the war. The CCP, under the command of Marshal Chen Yi and General Liu Bocheng, aimed to deliver the final blows of the Kiaomintang forces in eastern China. The Huai Hai Campaign unfolded with a series of intense engagements and strategic maneuvers. The CCP employed their signature tactics, combining encirclement, frontal assault, and exploiting weaknesses in the KMT's defense. My friend, it seems your defenses are about as strong as a paper wall against a relentless onslaught. Yes. The CCP's military course in the Battle of Huai Hai involved a masterful combination of tactics. Their aim was to encircle and isolate KMT divisions, cutting off their supply lines and weakening their position. The CCP relentlessly pushed back the KMT forces, launching wave after wave of attacks to break through their defensive line. One of the pivotal moments of the Battle of Huai Hai came when the CCP forces successfully encircled and besieged the heavily fortified city of Zeus Hao. The siege lasted for weeks, and the CCP employing a variety of tactics to wear down the KMT defenders. The fall of Zeus Hao dealt a severe blow on the Kaomintang's central front, and it was a turning point that brought the civil war closer to its conclusion. Losing sucks! I want a new job! The Huai Hai campaign had taken its toll on the KMT forces. With their ranks depleted and their spirits shaken, they could do little but retreat, pursued relentlessly by the victorious CCP. The CCP forces continued their relentless pursuit, employing hit-and-run tactics, ambushes, and coordinated attacks to exploit the Kaomintang's disarray. The KMT, already in a weakened state, found themselves unable to regroup and mount an effective defense against the CCP's relentless onslaught. The Huai Hai campaign campaign concluded with a decisive victory for the CCP. The KMT forces suffered heavy casualties, and thousands of soldiers were either captured or killed. The defeat dealt a significant blow to the KMT's central front and marked a turning point to the Chinese Civil War. The CCP's control over central China solidified, paving the way for their future advances. And so, on October 1, 1949, the People's Republic of China was proclaimed by Mao Zedong, ushering in a new chapter in Chinese history and forever changing the political landscape of the nation. While the conquest of the remaining territories still took another few years, the work already began on rebuilding the nation from the ground up. This farm is ours now. You can go. No! This is mine! I will go nowhere! Long live Chairman Mao! This is our farm now! The CCP's vision was to create a socialist society through rapid industrialization and agrarian reform. The land was redistributed, providing peasants with ownership and the opportunity for a better life. Agricultural production was organized into communes, aiming to improve productivity and alleviate rural poverty. The transformative reforms were not without their challenges, as the CCP faced the immense task of modernizing the economy and uplifting the masses. The CCP also launched ambitious social campaigns, such as the Great Leap Forward, with the goal of accelerating industrialization and transforming China into a socialist society. However, the implementation of these campaigns faced significant setbacks. 
The Great Leap Forward brought both enthusiasm and criticism. It aimed to mobilize the masses and propel China forward, but its implementation led to unintended consequences. The massive scale of industrial projects and the emphasis on communal living strained resources and caused disruptions in agriculture production. The Great Leap Forward faced difficulties, resulting in widespread famine and economic setbacks that caused the deaths of millions of people. These challenges would lead to a critical reassessment of the CCP's policy and the direction of the nation. After the passing of Chairman Mao Zedong in 1976, a new chapter unfolded in Chinese politics. Deng Xiaoping emerged as a key figure, steering the nation toward economic reforms and opening up to the world. Deng's leadership ushered in an era of reform and opening up, where market-oriented policies, foreign investment, and the development of special economic zones took center stage. These changes propelled China's rapid economic growth, transforming it into the global economic powerhouse we see today amidst a still very present public sector. While the economic reforms brought prosperity, politically the Chinese Communist Party maintained its monopoly on power. However, the government introduced market-oriented reforms, allowing for increased private enterprise and economic liberalization. With the increasing role of private enterprise, entrepreneurs seized opportunities, driving innovation and contributing China's further economic growth. On the international stage, the victory of the Communist Party of China in the Chinese Civil War had significant geopolitical implications. The retreat of the Kiaomintang to Taiwan led to the establishment of the Republic of China, which continued to be recognized as the legitimate representative of China by many countries for decades to come. The division between mainland China and Taiwan remains unsolved, with both sides maintaining separate governments, as the world continues to watch the evolving dynamic between the two. This type of content is pretty time-consuming to produce. If you want to support my channel and help me create more of these videos, please consider subscribing to my Patreon under patreon.com slash historywithseb. As a thank you, subscribers receive exclusive behind-the-scenes content, early access to, and a shout-out at the end of every video, and decide what future videos should be about. So thank you for your support.